and I should turn on the mic. Um, my voice carries anyway, so. Um, right, so as I was saying, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point during the presentation. Uh, I'll try to also stop and ask if anybody has questions, and then we'll also do questions at the end. All right? So, um, today I'm here to talk to you about the continuous delivery pipeline and how do you go from commit to production and beyond. So, we're going to cover it in three steps. We're going to first talk about what is continuous delivery. We're going to do an overview of the pipeline itself. And then we'll watch the pipeline in action. So let's start with uh, what is continuous delivery? Well, maybe we should say what isn't continuous delivery? Continuous delivery isn't taking your existing pipeline and just going faster, right? So if you have a leaky pipeline uh, and you're just going faster, you're going to break things. So the idea is to not use your existing pipeline, or if you don't have a pipeline. Really, the point of continuous delivery is the ability to get changes of all types, including new features, bug fixes, configurations, and experiments into production or into the hands of users as quickly as possible, but in a sustainable way. And this is said by Jez Humble, who knows a thing or two about continuous delivery because he wrote the book on continuous delivery. And it's a fantastic book. It really covers pretty much everything what I'm going to talk about. And actually, that was, that was all I wanted to say. Just read the book. It's fantastic. Um, no, I'm, I'm joking, of course. Um, so I wanted to talk about a, a little concept I, I like to call the continuous delivery continuum. So every company falls somewhere on this continuum, whether you're kind of a more traditional organization that delivers to production, say, once or twice a year. Uh, you know, you're still following probably a waterfall model and so forth. So you're kind of on, on the one end of the spectrum. And then uh, there's the other end of the spectrum, the unicorns, right? And that's the companies that are delivering to production dozens, if not hundreds of times a day, right? So your GitHubs, your um, Netflixes, your Amazons. But realistically, everybody falls somewhere in the middle, right? So those are your two extremes, but everybody falls somewhere in the middle. So some companies, you know, you might be just discovering continuous integration, you're, you know, start, or let's say you're kind of more mature and you're deploying to production at the end of every scrum iteration, you're doing agile and so forth, and, or you're somewhere in the middle, right? But ultimately we all, we all fall somewhere there. And the point of my presentation today is I want to convince you that in this continuous delivery continuum, you want to shift closer to those attack unicorns over there, right? You kind of, you want to be more like the unicorns. And you might say, well, why? Why would I want to do that? Well, how many show of hands? Who likes the weekend all night long deployments? Anybody? No? <laughs> right, the heroics. Uh, and what's interesting is software, is software is unique because in software, when something's painful, the way to reduce that pain is to do it more often. And it, it feels counterintuitive. Our, our reaction to something that's painful is to kind of hold back and not do it, lock down, put in more processes. Uh, but in software, the longer it takes for you to build up your feature, right, the more money you've spent and the more changes have happened, the larger your problem space becomes when inevitably something goes wrong. So instead, if you reduce your change sets, you're reducing your problem space, you're reducing the amount of money that you're spending and the amount of assumptions before delivering to production. And this feeds into a metric called cycle time. Cycle time is defined as the time it takes from deciding to make a change, whether it's a bug fix or a feature, to having it available to users, right? So this is a metric, it's a really powerful metric that organizations can start to capture and then as they work towards continuous delivery, ideally you see that metric falling, right? The amount of time it takes to go from idea to production. 
And this is captured really well by Dura Karan's uh, blog post on ar arguing that shipping is the heartbeat of your company, right? So if you're shipping, say, once a year, twice a year, do you have a pulse? I, I don't know. So um, his, his point is, I mean, you don't want to, well, maybe you want to fast pulse too, but uh, it, his, his point is software only becomes valuable when it's in the hands of users, right? Before then, it's just a bunch of costly assumptions. So hopefully, I've gotten you really excited about continuous delivery, or maybe, oops, maybe not so excited. But um, let's actually break down the pipeline and go into the details itself. So the high-level overview of the pipeline. Well, we start with um, this piece. And well, actually, there's a bunch of things to the pipeline. I'm really breaking it down into the fine details of what you want to do in this pipeline. And it seems overwhelming just looking at it. But we're technical people, and we'll take a complex problem and break it down into man manageable t chunks, right? So let's take this pipeline and start breaking down. So we'll start with the developer. She'll create a new branch and work on that branch following kind of the best practices locally. Oops. Clicker is following the best practices locally on her workstation, right? So we're doing test-driven development. Whether you do your tests first or right after, it doesn't matter. But as long as you're writing the tests kind of at the same time. We do our static check, our style checks, our static analysis, running our unit tests, and so forth. And we'll push that up to the CI server, where the CI server will rerun all of these tests in case the developer forgot to do them. Or, most likely the case, your workstation is configured differently than your target environment, right? So if you're working, say, on a Mac, your target environment is Linux, it's always worth rerunning kind of all of the analysis and steps that we did locally. At this point, we bring in our QA person who's helping us write our acceptance tests, right? And uh, those are kind of your end-to-end -end tests. And they're also helping with the contract tests, which we'll get into a bit later on. Any questions so far? All right, so uh, once our CI system says everything's good, we start to do a code review. And code reviews are a great way to uh, distribute awareness and distribute ownership of bugs, uh, of uh, code changes, and so forth. So, yep? I have a quick question. When you say a new branch, what's on that branch? Is that a story? Is that a. <laughs> It depends. Um, let's say you're doing a bug fix. That's a branch. Um, ideally, and, and Jez will argue, and, and in the continuous delivery book, um, to avoid branches almost completely. Um, I, I, I agree with that. I think that branches should be as short as possible. So ideally, a day or two at most. And so, um, or maximum a week. Let's say you cap it at a week. Once you start to get into branches that are longer than that, going into months, that's kind of the long-lived branch uh, concept, and it leads into a lot of pain um, because you get into merge conflicts, lots of different branches working. Like if you have a long-lived branch for several months, it's just it's falling further and further behind. You have to constantly try to keep it up to date, uh, and so forth. So, okay. Once we get our uh, code review done, we do a merge, and our CI system reruns everything on that new master or that new trunk branch. And kind of we, re we go through everything else as we did before. But more, more importantly, once we hit master, we start to build our binary. And this binary is going to go on a quest to production. So it's going to go through lots of tries and tribulations. It's going to fail. It's going to die. And then we'll have to create a new binary. But ultimately, the binary's goal is to try to get through all of the gates before it can make its way to production. So we take our binary, and we deploy it in an isolated environment. So if you're using a platform as a service, say something like Pivotal Cloud Foundry, this is trivial. CF push to a different environment uh, with a different route, you're done. Right? It's, it, it's very straightforward. Uh, if you have an artisanal handcrafted 
uh, platform, well, it's going to take you a bit more work, but it's also possible. We, we have one internally, and we figured out a way to do it. But um, the point is to de try to deploy this binary, working together with your QA person, to make sure that the binary starts up and it's passing smoke tests. And they, again, the idea of this pipeline ultimately is to build confidence in this binary as it's moving from the left-hand side of the, um, of the pipeline all the way to production. You're building up confidence in this binary. So once we, once we know that it starts up, and again, you want that fast feedback, uh, we deployed to development, so at this point we should have some confidence that we're not going to bring down development and uh, impact everybody else. We start it up, we run some smoke tests, and at this point we'll also start monitoring our logs, right, so via log aggregation, and also pull in some metrics like load and uh, performance metrics, things like that. Once we have it in production, we're going to start to, uh, sorry, production, once we have it in development, we deploy to the staging environment. And every company has n number of staging environments. That's why I said staging star, right? So you might have a QA, a UAT, a DIT, whatever, SIT, whatever people call their different various environments. But ideally, you go through them in an automated fashion. And these environments are usually the purview of your QA person. But of course, the developer and the QA and the uh, operator are also interested. And in this environment, we kind of, we follow the same, okay, this clicker's going too fast. Um, we follow the same pattern. And this is starting to look repetitive, but the idea is you want to test the same way in every environment as you're going through the pipeline, right? So you want to kind of, you want to achieve that dream of dev and QA looking like production, right? But at the very least, you can follow the same testing and the same verification processes in all of those environments. And um, once we have it in, we've gone through all of our staging environments, we do a dark deployment to production. Again, this is primarily the purview of our operator. Uh, and we kind of make sure everything is working. Um, and in production, you also want to start to include business metrics, right? So things like what's our revenue look like? You want to start charting, and if anything gets out of whack, you want to send alerts, right? Because this is production after all. <clears throat> so once we have our production dark deployment done and we're confident with it, we do a live, we make that production deployment live. And again, our operator, our dev, and our QA are all involved here. And you want to, again, same thing as before, you want to capture metrics, you want to um, look for error rates, you want to capture business metrics. And um, that, that's kind of the end of that pipeline. Now, you might be saying, well, you know, the QA person, they actually do a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, you didn't really mention, like exploratory testing or performance testing, right? And, and hey, we also have a security person. And, you know, they do some static analysis or penetration testing, right? And where do those fall in in your pipeline? And I think that as your pipeline matures, you can start to take some of these things that are possible to automate, like performance testing or static analysis, security static analysis or security penetration testing, like some of these things you can automate, you'd start to include them in the pipeline. Um, but some things like exploratory testing really just happen, it's an orthogonal concern. But it is something that you should be doing as well. Right, so high level, that's the pipeline. And as, as I was saying, you're, you're trying to build up confidence in that binary as you're going from that new branch, from that fir very first commit, all the way to production. You're building up confidence that when you do go live, nothing's going to break, or at least nothing that you thought is possible is going to break. So, any, and, and kind of the, the last point on this pipeline, it seems big, it is, there's a lot involved, and it's a journey. It's not something that you wake up tomorrow and you say, we need a pipeline, all right, let's get to it, and you're done by the end of the day, right? Like, that's not how it works. Um, it's going to be something that you really have to invest in. Uh, at Teachers, we've been working at it for 
six plus years, right? And we're still not there. We have mo some of the pipeline done, not everything. So it takes a while and it's something that you have to build up on, right? So you have a foundation. You start with source control, hopefully. Everybody has that, right? You start, <laughs> you, you build up your unit tests and kind of you, you're working on your pipeline um, and you build on top of the previous successes. So any questions so far? What was dark fraud? Is that like NPR or is that production boxes that are on? Or? It, it would be production, but not, um, not addressable by the users, right? So the same exact production environment, but in a, so for example, if we're talking about a Pivotal Cloud Foundry, you would deploy to production on a different route, on a different endpoint that the users don't necessarily know about. Um, but you can do smoke tests, you can call your slash health endpoint, you can make sure that the application is running before switching all of live uh, data to it. So it's, it's, called, it's a blue-green deployment. That's kind of the concept uh, Martin Fowler talks about, so. Yeah. So uh, uh, roughly how long does it take for, you know, I guess for people to start from the beginning of the pipeline to do it? Yes, very good question. Um, as fast as possible will be the, uh, would be my, Oh, sorry. thank you. Uh, the question was, how long does it take uh, to go from one end of the pipeline to the other end, right? Like, how long does that take? Um, obviously, it's going to depend on what, what you're doing, but your, role, your goal as a pipeline creator should be to make it as fast as possible. Uh, at DevOps Days Toronto this year, uh, somebody at Shopify kind of talked about their pipeline. From commit to production is 10 minutes after running 40,000 tests across a, a couple hundred machines, right? But like, that's, ideally, that's where you get to. Um, again, it's not always possible, or it's not possible definitely at the very beginning, right? If you have your eight hour long integration test, that's, that's gonna be the first thing you have to target, right? Starting to parallelize those. But um, that's, in, and actually the blog post, uh, Duron's blog post, he really, I, I, I thought it was very insightful talking about the behavior differences in a development team when you have from uh, commit to production in, let's say, under five minutes versus behavior difference when it's like at the end of the iteration or quarterly and kind of the behaviors of devs change and kind of your, your involvement and enthusiasm changes as well. Yes? Uh, so, you use pipeline, but when you are doing QA, do you QA the Delta or do you QA the whole thing? And do you automate the QA? You automate the QA. That, oh sorry. Uh, right. uh, the question was, for QA, do you, where do you do the QA? Is it the deltas of the changes, uh, I guess, in which environment, or do you automate QA and kind of where does that go? So ideally, um, I think I was showing here, ideally, the QA portions, the acceptance tests, the contract tests, they all happen in an automated fashion and your QA and your QA devs or your QA uh, people are working on it together with you automating it. And then there's exploratory testing, which is something that happens kind of outside of the pipeline, where they'll take the current state of the application and try to poke holes in it, try to break it, and so forth. That's kind of, that's what QA people do best. But you can't, you can't have an automatic pipeline if the QA isn't automated. All right. I'll, I'll keep going and then, uh, and then we can kind of get into it. And I know that it's, I do want to say that I'm, I'm sympathetic to the challenge of having uh, manual QA. I know lots of organizations still have manual QA. We still have some manual QA before something goes into production. It's really, it's a cultural shift, right? And ultimately, there's a lot of technical challenges to creating a continuous delivery pipeline, but the technical stuff is solvable. It's, it's fairly, like, 
people have solved it. It's the cultural changes that are going to be the most challenging for any organization. And the way to the way to kind of start to get that pipeline into your organization is building on successes. And I'll talk a little bit more about how do you, how do you introduce it and how do you how do you kind of get it into your organization. But let's go into um, let's let's watch the pipeline in action, right? So we kind of went over high level what does the pipeline do, but let's take a kind of a real world example and see what happens uh, when we when we do that through our pipeline. So again. That's our pipeline. Our example, I'm going to steal straight from that blog post by, by Dura Karan. Um, basically, the, the story was you have a user that calls you. They say, hey, I'm trying to sign up for your service. Um, for some reason, I can't get past the sign up screen. I think it might be because I have a hyphen in my name. I don't know. And then the developer says, oh, of course. The regular expression doesn't allow hyphens in the name, right? So let's say you have some validation logic on the name of the user, and uh, hyphen was not an allowed uh, part of the username, right? So you know this is a fairly simple, probably one-line change, and the idea is to track how quickly can we get that one-line change into production, and that's our cycle time, right? So. We'll take our dev again, right? And uh, she'll start off with um, creating a new branch, kind of like as we talked about, doing kind of all the best practices locally on their workstation. And she has everything passing, everything's looking good. We made our change to the regular expression, updated our tests, ideally added a test of a user who has a hyphen in their name, right? Watch it break and then make that test pass. And uh, she'll push it up to the CI server. So again, we're rerunning everything on the CI server because the CI server is ideally the same target OS as our dev and production environments, right? And uh, as we talked about our acceptance tests, which we work with our QA people to build them and make them automated, they fail, right? So our QA tests have failed, but they failed early on. And here I want to harp on, and uh, the slides are already posted uh, on s speaker deck, and uh, I'll post this version of them as well later on. Um, so I want to harp on, on fast feedback a bit, right? So we, we, we had a question, how long does it take? Ideally, every error scenario happens as early in the pipeline as possible. And the pipeline is as fast as possible, especially on the CI front, because Developers, like most humans, have short attention spans, right? Uh, if, if, a pipe, if a CI build is taking more than, say, two to five minutes, we're off to Twitter or Facebook or whatever, right? Like, that's, that's human nature. Um, and the value of pushing these acceptance tests to your CI system is on the CI system, you can start parallelizing your tests. So locally, you, you know, if you're, if you're services are small enough and your uh, acceptance tests run quickly enough, run them on your local machine by all means. But if you have, you know, like in Shopify's case, 40,000 test cases, you running all of those locally on your machine, it's going to take too long. So that's why you let the parallelized build farm handle them. A great example of this is Facebook, who, as far as I, at least this was a, a couple years ago, they actually spin up a server or Docker container for every single acceptance test. So say they have 10,000 acceptance tests, they spin up 10,000 servers or containers, and each one of those runs a single test. And so now you've done the ultimate parallelization, right? Your feedback on acceptance tests is as slow as the slowest test, and that's it. So parallelizing tests is also non-trivial, right? If you have a bunch of stateful acceptance tests, you're going to have a hard time parallelizing them, right? So again, this is a different way to build acceptance tests than you're probably used to. So uh, we get our feedback quickly. We broke the acceptance test, let's say, somewhere else. Uh, we weren't expecting a hyphen. Now we're getting hyphens. So we fix our, our developer, she fixes them up, pushes the code back through the pipeline. Everything's passing, and we start to get to our contract test. So I, I mentioned uh, we'll talk about the contract test. And they failed, so let's, uh, let's talk about those contract tests. Contract tests are a concept called, come from a concept called consumer-driven contracts. 
So this is uh, something that Martin Fowler talks about a lot, so you can uh, look that up. It, it, he has a lot of great articles. But basically, the, the high-level idea of consumer-driven contracts is your client, your downstream services in a microservice environment, provide you with tests that say how they're using you. So if you have, say we have a name validation service, right? This is what our developer was working on. She's made it allow hyphens now. Um, our downstream service, say the sign up service, provides to the user validation service tests that say, I call you at these resources, at these endpoints, I provide you these JSON documents, and uh, these JSON blobs, and I expect th these JSON results. Right? So that, that's the idea of consumer-driven contracts. And again, it's about building up confidence in your artifact as you're going through the pipeline. Because especially in a microservice world, as you're building up new artifacts and making changes to your APIs, if you just, like, you can push them to production and have your fingers crossed that none of the downstream clients break, or you can start to work w towards consumer-driven contracts and, and actually get, get some confidence that your downstream services don't break. And uh, the easiest way to start implementing them is to just copy-paste tests, right? So you have, you know, we talk, um, they're talking about REST templates and uh, mock MVC tests in uh, Spring. You can just write those tests and copy-paste them into the service that you're consuming. And that's actually how we started out with them. And then kind of as you mature, you can look at a bunch of these open source libraries like Pact, uh, Pact JVM, and Pacto. And Sprinkler Contract, which does it GA. Perfect. Okay. There you go. Um, right. So that's, that's consumer-driven contracts. Uh, so let's say our sign-up service wasn't expecting hyphens in the name. We fix those up, so forth. You know, this is a quick example, right? Uh, our developer ha has fixed this all up. Uh, she pushes it. We go back through the pipeline again, re-verifying, and now everything's passing. We move on to the next point, and that's code reviews. And as I mentioned, code reviews are a fantastic way to share knowledge, to distribute code ownership, right? So in a lot of organizations, especially traditionally, uh, this is Bill's code, and that's uh, you know Maria's code and don't don't touch them and and then that person goes on vacation or leaves the company and now that knowledge is not distributed right so this is the value of either pair programming right if you're doing it the pivotal way and you're pairing all the time great that's code reviews as you're going uh, and then or, or if you're not following that code reviews are another way so and of course they find bugs sometimes but that's kind of that's a extra benefit uh, so our developer, our second developer said, yeah, this looks good to me. Our first developer merges it into master, and we rerun everything on our CI system as before, on the master branch now. Everything's looking good. And at this point, this is when we're building our, our brave little binary that's going to try to get to production. So take our binary, and we do that isolated deployment that we talked about earlier. And this isolated deployment really wants, you want to just check, like a, it's a sanity test. Does this application start up? And we find it doesn't. So again, going back to feeling safe about your deployment going to production and also getting that fast feedback because we've gone, we've had lots of examples where you make some code change, you add, say, a new configuration to your uh, Spring environment, to your Spring Boot app, and you forgot to add it to your config repository. And now, the application doesn't start. But because you didn't test does it start for, say, two, three, four weeks, at that point, when you deploy to dev and the application no longer starts up, you're like, oh, crap, what was it? Which commit broke startup? If you test startup in an isolated environment on a regular basis, ideally, you catch these earlier and you reduce your problem space when the application doesn't start up. Can I yeah, a please. So, don't to understand what is isolated uh, space in the sense. Is dev environment an isolated space? No, because dev is usually shared. 
amongst all the devs and, and QA potentially, right? It's, it's something, it's an environment that everybody else ties into. It's not in production, but it's kind of, it's a central environment. So an example of how we do it, um, well, if you have a Pivotal Cloud Foundry, it's a CF push. Um, we, we have Pivotal Cloud Foundry, we're not fully utilizing it yet. So uh, in, our ex in our environment, uh, we're currently using Chef to deploy uh, Spring Boot embedded Tomcat apps. The way we test in an isolated environment is we use, uh, Chef has this concept called Test Kitchen. It spins up uh, an isolated Docker image on the CI system, installs the application, and then tries to start it up. And if that failed, if passes or fails, we destroy the Docker container at the end of the build. So that's an isolated environment. We, we make it look kind of like production. It's a CentOS Docker image, but uh, it's isolated and it doesn't, so basically, if, if I made a change. So the only reason you do this is because you don't trust the data. Is that what you're saying? Oh no, it's not a trust thing. It's a, it's, well. Uh, what are the, not necessarily sure. really to say, because you want to identify the issue as early as possible. To exactly. Where, again, that the fish memory for the developer, right? Yes. So you want to push to the, like you use the Cloud Foundry as example, you want to you say a push there to the dead environment, immediately you're going to check up the, uh, the startup, isn't it? Right. This is where you found a problem, you can fix it right away, instead of waiting, right. waiting for the future. Right? right, but let's say if you push directly to dev, now, if, say you have a microservice environment or whatever, even if you have like 10 services, say three other services are depending on that service in dev, now that service is down while you work on fixing that issue. So if you could push it to a different URL or push it in a Docker container or whatever the use case is, you checked if it started up before it even hit dev and you got that feedback even faster, because you did it in an isolated way and you're also not impacting anybody else. Does that kind of make sense? The, the, the primary thing that we catch is a dev adds, um, say, a new uh, at value, I think it, it is. Uh, you're kind of pulling in a new configuration and you forget to add it into the application.properties that's in a separate repository. Because as the um, continuous delivery book strongly advocates, you want to have your source control, your source controlled in, um, your source controlled application in one repository. So that's like the app that you're working on and all the configurations in a different repository. And those configurations are different for each environment that you're deploying to dev, production, QA, and so forth. So those are ideally in a separate they, they don't come together with the artifact because if you put the dev configs together with the artifact, well now that artifact is only for dev, right? And you can't take that same binary and deploy it to production because it has dev configurations in it. So you have to build a new artifact that has production configurations. I don't know if that, that kind of makes sense. Basically keeping, keeping the binary the same and that binary goes to different environments using configurations from a different location. So is that is that just another GitHub repository then? Exactly, exactly. And so in our, in our use case, and actually uh, if you come to the talk that's happening this afternoon by my colleague June, he's going to talk about a tool that actually generates these uh, Git repositories that are different for every environment. Like one, a Git repo for dev and a separate Git repo for production that has different access controls, right? Because most, a lot of organizations have this separation of duties concerns, so you want the production configurations in a different place that devs can, ideally they can see it, but they can't write to it. They have read but not write permissions. Okay. Um, how am I doing on time? Still good? All right. Uh, so we found, we caught the startup issue early. We get our startup, we fix our configs, we push, we push that up, we rebuild. So that artifact that we had tried to start up, well, it died, right? The artifact uh, didn't make it through the trap door and uh, now we need a new artifact. So we build that up, that new artifact is going through this same pipeline 
uh, and we do our startup, we do our smoke test, and now we do our deployment to the dev environment, right? So uh, we deploy to dev, it's looking good. Again, we, start, we tried starting it up early. It does start up and we start to check our logs and our load in dev. Everything's looking good. Fantastic, let's move forward. So we start to deploy to our staging, whatever it's called in your, in your organization, environments, right? So again, where you saw this before, we're retesting the same thing. Ideally, you're doing the same thing in every environment. And now we do our production dark deploy, right? And at this point, you might say, well, wait a second, Arthur, we were talking about continuous delivery, not continuous deployment. Why are we deploying to, to production? And this is where I really want to highlight a, an important takeaway from the talk. Separating the concern of deploying to production and releasing a new feature to your end user. So in most, in most organizations, we lump that concept together. We say when we deploy something, it's available to users, and so therefore we need to gate our deployments, we need to only do them at the end of a uh, scrub iteration or whatever. Um, I'm gonna argue, and not, not only myself, this is um, uh, Martin Fowler and many others, will argue that you wanna separate these two concerns and allow frequent deployments to production, but releasing is something that the business decides when something gets released. And really, you wanna do this because you wanna continually exercise your pipeline all the way to production. A perfect example of why you wanna do this, and we had this happen to us, we had set up a pipeline to production, uh, it's a push button deploy, and because we were doing a POC for it, we used the credentials of one of the um, people in the operations department. And that person changed departments, they no longer had access to production, and guess what, four weeks later when we tried to do another deployment to production, well, it failed because we were using that person's credentials and they don't have access to production anymore. So we only caught that when we actually needed to do a deployment and said, oh no, okay, quickly go fix this, change it to a bot's name and so forth, right? So you're kind of, you're, you're fighting a fire when you wanted to just deploy to production. So if you're deploying on a regular basis, we would have caught that the minute the person left the department, lost their credentials, and we wouldn't have had to dig for you know, a couple hours trying to figure out why our deployment's failing. So you wanna find these leaky, parts of your pipeline as soon as possible. And um, in fact, the ThoughtWorks technology radar, which uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a fantastic, uh, think of it like the, is it the Gardner Magic Quadrant or whatever, all of those other kind of businessy things. Uh, this is for devs and for kind of architects and kind of uh, more technical people. It covers the, uh, it covers technology pretty, pretty well in depth and one of the concepts that they talked about, they have a quad, they have a, um, uh, they have different sec sections like assess and adopt and so forth. You can look into it, but what they put in their most recent edition in adopt is decoupling deployment from release, right? So this is exactly what we were just talking about. And you might say, well, if I'm deploying constantly, you know, how do I, I have a half-baked feature, I don't wanna deploy it yet, right? Do I wanna keep it on a branch for two months? while I'm working on that, on that feature, and I just said, don't do that, right? So the way you avoid that is by using a concept called feature flags. So feature flags, again, is, is the idea of taking a feature that you're working on at the moment that's not fully done yet and hiding it from the user and exposing it only when you want to. And the easiest way to start feature flags is with an if statement and like a config file, right? And this is actually how we started with it. It's, it, Feature flags are, are sometimes get a bad rap, especially when uh, they're overused and you have lots of conditionals all throughout your code, making it really hard um, to keep track of which feature flags are there and which aren't. So one of the things that, that we started to do is uh, track a metric in Grafana, in Graphite, that just shows you how many feature flags exist in this application. And then, you know, as a, you can start to see it creeping up, and ideally you have a conversation about that. Uh, another, another idea to try to keep feature flags down, create a test, a unit test, 
that says, OK, this feature flag should only be here for three months, say. And after three months, if this feature flag is still here, fail the build. And so three months from now, if the feature flag is still there, fail the build. Oh, why did it fail? Oh, we have this feature flag we don't need anymore. Remove, remove, remove. OK? So anyway, you can look at feature flags. You can start simple and get into more complicated uh, open source libraries like rollout and toggles. But I, I, I have 10 minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll leave questions till the end. So uh, we have all of these concepts in mind, feature flags, uh, deployment versus, versus release. And we, we push out our release to production. Again, we're monitoring uh, additional things like uh, business metrics and stuff like that in production. And at this point, you have a decision to make, do I stop or do I go, right? If you're in an environment that can't continuously deliver, say, or continuously deploy, say you ship uh, firmware to offline medical drive, like medical equipment, right? You can't constantly release, so you're going to stop. But regardless of whether you go forward or not, making this change live, you have exercised the pipeline the whole way through. Right? You now know, you have that confidence that there aren't any leaks in your pipeline. And if you're a SaaS company, you can probably go. Right? It's not a big deal. So things like uh, companies like GitHub and Netflix deploy hundreds of times a day. So we push out our, uh, we make our, our artifact live in production. You know, our logs and our, our load is looking good. Um, we don't see any elevated error rates, nothing like that. But we start to notice something strange our revenues dropping. And alarms start to go off. Oh my god, nobody's buying anything. What's going on? And this is, this is where the importance of monitoring comes in. Right? So you really want to have very good metrics and monitoring around especially key business, uh, key business things that you care about, like your revenue. Uh, so you might be using a Sensu and a Graphite to capture this data. Uh, you might be polling the slash metrics endpoint actuator in uh, Spring Boot. Uh, you're, maybe you're gathering metrics with something like a Dynatrace. Right? Like there's a lot of different tools that play in this space, but you need to have them in order to safely, continuously deliver. Right? So once we capture this, we found, oh my god, something's broken. You want fast rollback. Right? And something broken like this, you know, it went through the whole pipeline and we didn't catch it, right? So it's something that's going to require investigation offline. So roll back, take a look. The example here and uh, the example I like to use, I think it was Etsy, they had a CSS change that was hiding the buy button by accident. And you know, it went all the way through. I think this is before like the older web drivers that didn't actually look like is the thing enabled or not, right? Now, now that wouldn't get through, right? But something like that uh, can theoretically make it all the way through. And that's why you know, the system could be up and running. Everything's fantastic. But if you don't have that business metric, you won't know that you know, people aren't buying anything and the buy button's hidden. So we make our, our CSS changes. Uh, we push them out. Everything goes back through the pipeline. Everything's looking good. Uh, you know, people are able to buy things again, and our uh, heroic team goes on vacation. Right? So we fixed, we fixed our little tiny bug of there's a hyphen uh, in the person's username. But the power of coming back to them and saying, you know, say eight, ten minutes later, oh, try signing up now. Right? Like that's, that's the magic of having a robust pipeline, whereas in most um, organizations, you'll probably say, oh, OK, I'll let the developers know, and they'll get to it at some point when they get through their you know, scrums and, and different agile processes and so forth. So um, that's the pipeline. That's the pipeline in action. Again, building up confidence as you're going through the pipeline. And to do a quick recap, shipping is the heartbeat of your organization. The faster you can iterate, the faster you can get changes out, the faster you can react to customer needs, ultimately, the more profitable you'll be. And um, actually, Chef did a study on this. They looked at a bunch of different organizations. The organizations that ship more regularly do better financially. The pipeline is, there's a lot to it. There's probably a bunch of stuff that I didn't cover as well. 
right? And your pipeline might have even more things in it. But ultimately, it takes a while to build up. You can start small, right? So even this first check, putting in a CI server and just running unit tests, just doing style checks, like you're already, you've hit a huge pain point right away. Then I would argue you want to start to get into the other side, automating deployments, right? Whether it's to dev or to prod. Deployments that are done manually, huge place where you're going to, it's going to bite you constantly, right? So you want to start to automate that. And then you build in the middle, right? So you kind of start on one end, you, you go to the other end. You're not continuously deploying, but you're automating it. And then you start to build in the middle of the pipeline. And to, to sell it to your company, you really need successes, right? That's ultimately building on successes, building up that kind of, hey, we're actually getting things done. Hey, look, this is improving things. That's where that very first part, the CI section, really helps out. And uh, ultimately, I hope that uh, you know, if you're somewhere here in the middle of your continuously, continuous delivery continuum, that I've convinced you you want to move a little bit further to the right and uh, have a happier organization and team. So I'm Arthur Maltzen. Uh, I work at, I say, that is me. Uh, that was actually before, that was before kids. So uh, <laughs> yes, and shaved. Uh, that's my internet picture. Um, I say I work at a large pension plan at Young and Finch. It's an Ontario teacher's pension plan. We're always hiring. We're always looking for good people. So uh, come talk to me after if you're interested. Uh, and yeah, I like to say I'm 70% dev, 30% ops. Um, and then, yeah, 110% dev ops, of course. Uh, so yes, and then uh, one quick last thing. And again, the slides are all posted. Uh, one thing that I find personally that I get out of conferences uh, really, that I really like taking away from conferences is a bunch of tools to look into. So uh, I figured I'd just share a bunch of the tools that we love, that we use as teachers, and this is all posted on that speaker deck. Uh, it's on speaker deck there. Um, so you can go take a look. And that's it. Thank you. All right, so we have just one minute. Uh, who was it that had a question? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, it was about feature flags. Yes. I was wondering if you had any comments about using feature flags and deploying frequently. Um, how can you keep fast feedback on the features that are disabled? Because I haven't really seen them work in the production system yet. Right, that's, that's very true. Um, one thing, so a good example of feature flags is uh, Facebook rolling out their chat system. They hid it behind a feature flag. They also were hiding it from the users. And when they deploy to production, they'd enable small parts of it still hidden from the user and kind of, you know, they'd, they'd enable it for 5% of users that the chat window comes up. And then they deployed that and the servers melted, and oh my god, OK, let's fix this. And, 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 so, and so they iterated on it slowly as they went. So you can actually hide it from the user, but have it fully visible, right? Um, but behind the scenes, right? So there are ways to do it. I mean, I, it, feature flags, I, I'm not going to, it's a trade off, right? They do add complexity, especially to your, to your tests. So, um, I don't have a great answer. I think libraries, probably like toggles or rollout, probably help with the um, with the feature flag concepts. And we're very mature in that. We just started, really. Any other? So just quickly for feature flag, um, similar thing on that is that actually there's a cause on that as well because at the time you remove it, you have to refresh it and all that. So we did that all the time, and right. it's pain to ask. Um, and I wonder, since we're on the Cloud Foundry, and we sort of think about using multiple routes to do different things. Yeah, that's another way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I didn't repeat his question. OK, anyway, sorry. We don't yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I question that um, the difference between a lease and a point. I suppose there is a lease that is capability is available to the user. To the pipeline, you're going to deploy in the production. Right. Or it is some environment other than the production 
where you will put pure winding, but it's not actually production. Ideally, it's exactly production, but hidden from the user because inevitably, if it's not production, it's not production, and you're going to run into environment issues. Yeah. For sure. But again, if it's, if it's a dark deploy, right, so let's say all you do is you start it up and you don't expose it to the user, you've, you're already like 99% of the way there. Okay, are we, yeah, we're, we're, come talk to me after, please, um, and then, yeah, we just, we have to go. So how about the database requirements? <laughs> That's really so, Somebody asked me about databases last time I presented about this. Take a look at LiquidDB and a bunch of other uh, libraries that let you roll out uh, database changes in a more, in a safer fashion. Uh, but ultimately, database changes can't go this fluidly. They have to, they, you need a bit more planning around database changes, yeah, for sure. Painful. It is very painful. Anything, yes, 100%. All right, thanks.